So our objectives are going to be to discuss design for embankment rehabilitation. We'll talk about approaches to control, collect, and manage seepage, and we're going to spend a lot of time on that, on this on the seepage side of it. Um, and that's that's pretty much the uh, the morning will be these first two bullets, and then the afternoon session will be be looking at seepage reduction for the most part, uh, slope instability, and also talking about some seismic considerations. So there are some limits to what we're going to talk about. You know, the, the seepage control modifications, static stability modifications, and seismic modifications. We're going to keep it within within those sideboards. We're not going to get into overtopping or flood capacity modifications. Those those do apply, but that's, we're not going to get to it in this session because um, that there's a lot more uh, hydraulic hydrologic input that goes into those. And you know. Majority of our work is in rehabilitation. About half of my career I've actually spent in new design, the other half in rehab, but the majority of the work is in rehab. So, as I said, you know, everything we're doing on new design applies to rehab, but there is risk and consequences that are not there with a, with a new design. There are loads of good references on dam design. There's just a few up here. Um, Reclamation's Design Standard 13 is really good. Uh, Corps of Engineers has multitudes of EMs out there that the core folks are pretty uh, familiar with. Um, some of those are, I think, getting in the re-update, the revisions. Um, maybe they're 30, 40 years old, still good information in them. Publish papers and case histories. Um, I can't emphasize this enough that if you're doing a rehab and you've got a problem, look in, the, in, in published papers. Chances are somebody's had a similar problem sometime in the past, wrote a paper on it, and it might apply to what you're doing. So don't think like you're having to go this alone. There, there's a lot of really smart, smart people out there that have had similar problems. So, so do that research and it, it can really help support your selections or maybe guide you what not to do because maybe their choice was not good for your situation, similar problem, but it's not gonna work for you. So it helps, it helps narrow your scope. So really, really use that. And you know, older is not necessarily bad. I mean, stuff that Terzaghi and Peck came up with decades ago still applies. Now, there's been modifications, there's been improvements, but, you know, Terzaghi came up with essentially filtering criteria in 1922, I think. Now, we have tweaked that a little bit since then, but the general premise is still pretty much rooted in what he did. So keep that in mind. Just because it's an old paper doesn't mean it's a bad paper. And then there's also, this is a geotech engineer for dam, that's um, Robin Fell out of Australia. Another, I mean, it's a book like this, but it's a good comprehensive reference that kind of compiles a lot of these different EMs together, you know, in, in his way of writing about it. So there's, there's lots of good references. You know, if, you know, if you got examples in your organization you get, you can work with, grab those, look at those. Um, they, they're, they're helpful. But again, like with foundation design, you have to apply what's appropriate to your dam and to your, your embankment conditions and your foundation conditions. So again, Site characterization is really important again, this time with the embankment and the foundation, because you're, you're going to be rehabbing both for rehab design. So we're going to start off with a socrative question. So hopefully we can get that up and going. So the question is, is what overarching process results in about half of known dam failures? And this, this is recorded probably maybe, about, I'm not sure what the period of record in this is, but um, Quite, quite a long time. So is it slope instability, earthquakes, internal erosion, or operator error? So we'll take a moment, people can think about that. This one is internal erosion. It's about half a known dam failures. The other half are overtopping, a, a, a hydraulic issue, hydrologic issue, I say that wrong. So this is um, from Foster and Fell. It's actually out of best practices. There's a lot of da data here in the table, but um, they went through and looked at, okay, where where did you have dam failures? You know, in what part of the embankment of the foundation did it occur? So the first one here is internal erosion through the embankment. Of the, of the known cases, 39 were in the embankment. 19 were through the foundation, and two were from the embankment into the foundation. And they went through and said, here, what's your average probability of failure? Um, this, is, this is all good information and best practices. But we're seeing we're, there's quite a few through the embankment but half as many in the foundations. There's, the foundations are still, are still a, a problem with this. And then really what is the, the mechanism? So this is cracking and hydraulic fracturing, again from Foster and Fell out of best practices. So 
I talked about in the foundation design, you know, you, you have to shape those foundations. You don't want to have big changes in elevation. And this is why 35% of these cracking hydraulic fracturings were for differential settlement cross valley. Cause you, you know, the, you had steep changes in your valley. You didn't address, um, differential settlement cross section is 11%. So let's look at upstream to downstream. Do you have changes in, in your foundation profile or maybe there's structures in there that are, that are causing you issues? Um, differential settlement from the foundation. We talked about that. You get collapsible or uh, soil materials. Maybe those consolidate and you get, you get cracking issues. And desiccation cracking, a lot of times that's, that's you got hot, dry climates, you got clay materials, you get cracks that open up. Um, and then closure sections, if you're trying to you know, fill in an active river, you can't get it well to water. This, this is some older practice, but it, 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 it's in a lot of old dams. You know, that's, that's 5%. And then there is a good number. We got incidents of poorly compacted or high permeability zones in embankment fills. And some of them are at the foundation interface, but a lot of them are just in the embankment. And this, this would, I would tie more to a construction defect. You know, we, we, we try to do a good job of, of controlling compaction, controlling fill, but there are times you will get zones in there where it's not well compacted or some permeable material get in, gets in and you've got, you've got this high permeable zone where you can start getting water through there and then starting, if it's high permeable enough, you can start some erosion at that, at that contact. Um, so, there, there's more there's more stats out there in, in best practices and, and uh, Foster and Fell have, have done a lot with that, but just to give you some idea that, that that's why we're going to spend a lot of time talking about seepage because seepage is a big deal when you're doing rehabs and dams. Chances are that's what you're going to run into from a from a um, a dam safety dam stability concern is some sort of seepage issue. You know there are there are other ones, but chances are you're going to deal with this. So we're, that's why we're spending so much time on it. So what are we trying to do? Well, we want to prevent internal erosion. We want to stop that migration of fines because if you can stop that migration of fines, you can stop the failure mode. You, you, can, you can arrest it. So that, that, that's really what we're looking for. And you're going to see that in a lot of the upcoming slides of different ways to stop that internal erosion, stop that movement of material. Next, we're trying to limit pore pressures, reduce uplift, reduce seepage forces. If you can reduce seepage forces, if you don't have enough force there to start that initiation of material, you've also done your job and stop that internal erosion. The rest of these are, are, are I think, more, um, there's still things we need to do, but they're probably more on the maintenance side. Still would get people excited, but maybe not leading to a failure eminently, but they could progressively do one. So preventing wet spots or slu surface sloughing. We don't want water emanating out of the toe, or the toe or the slope of the embankment. It could start sloughing and progressively lead back. That is a slower mechanism, generally speaking, than some of these other ones, but it's still something we need to address. Which then ties into slope instability. Same with foundations, you control the water, you're gonna control your destiny and how well you can rehab the dam. And then limit loss of stored water. Maybe this isn't a life safety concern, but it's definitely a concern to, to owners and operators. You know, that, there's a lot of value in that water, especially going to Western US, it's an extremely valuable resource. You know, that for those that are not from the West, there's, there's a saying that um, whiskey's made for drinking, water's made for fighting because there's just a shortage of water in the West. So limiting loss of water is important. All right, so what are we gonna do? There's kind of, there's, there's two ways, two, two kind of ways you can do it, and, or maybe both ways. So reducing seepage, some sort of upstream control, barrier walls, blankets, liners, core trenches, you know, reduce it, don't let it get through the embankment. Second one is, is your downstream side of it. That's the collect and manage, uh, filters and drains, pretty much should always be considered. Um, and there, there are situations where filters and drains are inadequate. If you have large seepage flows, large seepage forces, you do need um, barriers to reduce it. But if you're doing a rehab, usually you start looking at filters and drains. Are they gonna work? Because you put that filter in, again, you're arresting that, that internal erosion. And sometimes you need both. Um, and, and really, the state of the practice, if, if you can do it, is to have both, that belt and suspenders, that, that reduction and that, that collection. Because um, then you're, you're redundant. We're, we're talking about life safety. If, if one has some weaknesses in it, the other one can address it. So if you, you've got a rehab project and you've got known seepage, well, obviously you're gonna go and address that location. 
but you also need to make sure this, this scenario doesn't exist in other parts of your dam. It gets back to that site characterization, understanding your dam, understanding your foundation, because there's been too many times where there's been a rehab built, like, oh yeah, we, got, we've got, we have seepage right here, so we're gonna, we're gonna put down a blanket. And then 50 feet away, more seepage pops out. Because maybe they didn't do enough investigation, they didn't look far enough, say, oh yeah, this defect does extend far enough. So again, it gets, I've been hammering this, I understand that, but it is important to understand your foundation conditions. And the, the good thing with you know, collection control, if you're doing things on you know, downstream side of the embankment, generally you can observe them. So like with foundation preparation, when you're doing seepage rehab, you can see what's going on. You can see, oh, there's a, there's this gravel layer is, is contributing to our seepage. It's still extending. Okay, we need, to, we need to get to the end of this to make sure we have it filtered. M may require reservoir lowering. Must, may, de depends on your scenario, what your head is, what your conditions are, um, which, which can be a, a difficult talking point because, again, there's the value in that stored water. There, there, there's water supply, recreation, all sorts of benefits to it. So it need, if it needs to be done for safety, it needs to be done, but those can be difficult conversations to have. And most likely you're going to be doing some sort of dewatering, maybe significant and invasive operations to do this rehab. If you've got seepage coming through, you want to do that rehab in the dry. You don't want water coming in and flooding your excavation, eroding materials. So there's going to be wells, there's going to be sumps, there's going to be well points. So it, it, there's, there's a lot to think about. And again, always in the back of your mind is what are our consequences if this doesn't quite work. So risks during construction. So if we're doing seepage repair at the toe of a dam with a reservoir, well, there's an open excavation. You do the excavation, you've actually now made it easier for internal erosion to start because you've lowered, you've taken away confining stresses at that point. So you need to be prepared for that. That's where the dewatering comes into play. What if you get a storm event during construction? Two things here, you could raise your pool level. You've now increased head on your condition and you, you could be destabilizing your toe. You could get more groundwater flow. You could get surface water flow into it. So there's, there's things you got to plan for, you know, during construction to make sure things don't get worse on you. So the, the tools that we use, so filters, you know, as has been talked about earlier in, in the class, you know, they, they limit internal erosion potential, you know, both for the embankment and the foundations. That the filter stops the erosion. The drain part, so the filter is a, is a, is a sand, that's your, that, that stops the erosion. Then the drain is a coarser material, a gravel, and that's gonna collect and manage the seepage. That's gonna control your phreatic surface in, in, in the embankment and, and, and let the water out. There's also re relief wells that you put in the foundation that's gonna reduce uplift for cer certain scenarios. And, you know, the, again, you gotta look at what your dam is. So these, there's geom they have various geometries and limitations, you know, based on what you have, what your embankment type is, what your foundation is. So we're gonna go through a whole bunch of slides. So here's some different concepts of, here's a cartoon sketch of what a rehab would look like. So these are things you can take and say, okay, which parts of these apply? And then even then innovate beyond that to what actually fits your geologic problem and your dam problem. And the thing I always tell people is just, you know, follow that water. You know, water takes the path of least resistance. So follow that water, follow that seepage, and make sure you're putting a filter everywhere it can get out. Sounds simple, but when you get complex geology, it can be challenging. But just as long as you can think, can that water get there? We probably need a filtered exit. So we need to understand the location and mechanism. How is it happening? Where is it coming out? Again, site-specific issues. Use the right concepts. And then that filtered exit just, it, it brings your risk down dramatically. And then if you've got key data, if you have existing data, this can be very beneficial, piezometers, because hopefully, well, first you gotta make sure the piezometers are good and they're reliable and they're, they're, they're measuring you know, real data. Because you know, if, they're, if they're not maintained and they're, they're fouled up and they're no good, then you don't wanna use them. But if it's good, reliable data, it's really something good you can calibrate your reservoir pool, you can calibrate your seepage models. You can really understand, helps you a lot in understanding what your foundation conditions. And then just like everything else, you know, don't make things worse. You know, even when you're investigating, you know, make sure you're using the right drilling methods. You're not, you're not gonna do anything to hydrofract your dam. Or, or cause other problems. So just, even just the investigation page, phase, you gotta be careful that you're, you're not causing harm or making things worse. So some potential failure paths. So we had a plan view of an bank on the top, uh, 
profile, and a cross section. So we've got a few different ones. AB, so it's here and here, either side of the spillway wall. We've got potential failure paths. We've got a, you know, this one's showing a vertical spillway wall. Well, you can't get good compaction against a vertical face. So you're going to have lower density material there, you, which is a place for seepage is going to concentrate possibly. And if it's low enough density, maybe cause internal, ro internal erosion results from it. C, along the outlet works conduit down here. I'll always conduit through the dam. If that's not designed well, you know, it's again, same thing. You can't get compaction to it. You know, modern standard is you've got some, you've got a batter, you've got a concrete encaser on a pipe, you've got a batter so you can get vertical normal forces on those slopes and just have a better bond and a filter collar downstream. Well, if it's a, an older dam, you know, vintage 50s, 60s, it may have anti-seep collars, which are just concrete blocks put around the pipe that you can't compact well against. And there's been numerous issues with, with, with these anti-seep collars. Um, not a standard of practice anymore. Uh, D and E, we've already talked about these in the previous one. We've got foundation changes, um, foundation slope changes. So you could get cracking through here. Uh, section F down here, we have a core that doesn't get down to our low permeability material. So we have a, we have a hanging cutoff. So there's gonna be seepage coming under that. And then on the downstream si side of the, the core trench, it goes into alluvium. We don't have a filter, so we now have an unfiltered exit there. So there's several spots in this simple concept, simple sketch of where you could have uh, seepage issues. And then there's one common, mostly common feature here, is that they're tied to foundation issues or penetrations. So again, I think I said earlier, we, we can generally do a pretty good job of compacting earth fill and the bulk of the bank is pretty good. It's these small details where you can have your problems, these vertical walls, these penetrations, these foundation changes. That's, that's where you want to focus at. And, you know, if you've got seepage going on over here and you've got a rehab, you might want to think about looking over there too because you've got similar conditions. Or if you've got seepage on one side of your spillway wall, you may want to go to the other side of the spillway wall. So differential, cracking from differential settlement. We talked about this earlier, but again, you get steep valley profiles, you get cracks. That, that correspond to where those profile changes. Um, also, the second one over here, we've got a soil rock foundation. You get settlement of the soil. The rock doesn't compress as much. You get cracking. So it's just understanding those foundation conditions to help point you where you might have concerns. So the next several slides are going to be cartoons, just showing some different concepts on different rehabilitations. And again, th these are some guidelines, give you some sideboards, some ideas, and you, you got to figure out what fits your conditions. And one thing to remember, the, the phreatic surface on all of these, this would be a pre-rehabilitation phreatic surface. So it's gonna, this is what you're going to look at, a phreatic surface you're going to have when you start your rehab. The, the solution would bring that surface down, would be the goal. So the first one, uh, we've got some seepage coming out of the dam. We're going to just do a simple weighted filter against the downstream slope. So this is just as simple. You put filter sand, you got seepage coming out, you put filter sand on your, on your downstream toe and maybe a blanket running out a little bit and you cover it with a gravel, maybe some riprap. So it's just a reverse filter, it's a weighted filter so that water, this would, basically water would just seep out of this thing, the, seep out of that rock. This is typically more of a emergency response. You might do something a little more permanent with, with pipes and, and putting some cover on it, but it's a good, a good first step and, and again, we've got to make sure this gravel or riprap you know, doesn't blow out, doesn't erode. It, can, it has enough weight to resist whatever seepage forces are coming at it. Again, that's kind of an uh, emergency one. Typically speaking, and you'll see this through a lot of the rest of the slides, this came out of um, the FEMA filter manual from 20, 2011. Generally, you want half the hydraulic head of a cover over the base of your, of your filter. And that's just to prevent a blowout situation so that it, it doesn't heave, it doesn't blow out. It's enough confining stress to keep everything in place. So that's, that's kind of an overarching tenant that we have in a lot of these designs. Again, that first one was more of a kind of a quick rehab. So here's a cartoon of what we just showed. Same concept as the first one, filter drain, gravel, and now we're putting a berm over the top to give it that confining stress. And you'll need to be aware, so we've got you know, filter protection for the embankment. But a lot of times you'll need to put filter on top of that, that uh, gravel 
just so you don't get a migration of fines down in the, into the drain material and plug it. So that's why you'll see there's an encasement around the gravel in this figure. And that's, that's a pretty standard, pretty standard design just to protect that gravel. Because if it gets plugged with fines, it's not going to behave as a drain anymore. So here's a few photos from construction from a similar type of concept, similar using that concept. So we've got alluvium over here. This was an embankment that had, I think, about 40 feet of alluvium at the downstream toe. The, the, the core was cut down into bedrock. A lot, they had a lot of uplift, I think 15 feet of piezometric head at the toe of the dam. So we got alluvium exposed, putting down our sand layer, our gravel layer, more sand, and then starting to bring the cover in. And then you see we've got this sand back here that's going to march up the slope and give us, they're going to build you part of a chimney going up that slope. Turn around, looking the other way, just the, the same concept. We've got sand, gravel, sand, put the cover over. Um, this is, you take a lot of care when you're placing this. You don't want to contaminate any of the sand, the gravel, any of these materials. You want them to have their, their low fines content. You know, usually in, in the sand and stockpile is 3%. Maybe you allow it to get to 5% after it's in place and compacted. But there's a lot of caution. You don't allow equipment that tracks off of it to track onto it. Um, you, this is actually on alluvium. So this loader is filling this bedding box, and then the excavator is placing it up so we're not getting tracking, we're not contaminating. And then here's just an aerial view of a, the finished product. So they were all under here. There's a, uh, the blanket drain and then the chimney comes up the slope. And something you need to keep in mind, so we've now put this big berm in here. We've got this large flat area, or maybe it's got a 1% or 2% slope. And now you're going to concentrate surface flows on the abutments, on these groin areas. Well, you want to make sure that you actually protect the surface runoff. I know this is not a seepage question, but it is a maintenance question that does come into play. So you got to make sure you have appropriate you know, surface drainage for whatever features you're putting in there. Because if you put this in and then you get a big rainstorm and you get a big gully and it starts washing out your new berm and your new filter and your new drain, that's not going to be a happy situation for anybody. So this scenario, we've got a, a confining layer that runs under the embankment, don't have a cutoff into the high permeability to the low permeability. So just embankment set in a confining layer. Somewhere up here, we've got this reservoir has access to this high permeable foundation. So we've got you know, two phreatic surfaces. Here's the embankment phreatic surface probably isn't looking that bad. The foundation is, is going to be pretty high. And you, you so, okay, we'll put a long berm on and, and address it. It may not actually help that foundation because all you're doing is you're just probably in this high permeable zone, you're just pushing, pushing things out farther because it's got that confining layer. This may be in a place where uh, uh, relief wells might be a better option. Or, um, or some other system that penetrates this confining layer and lets that pressure out. So here's an embankment just sitting on a permeable foundation. High horizontal permeation, again, same consider, even without the confining layer, it's going to try to maybe push out towards the end. So you've got to be careful that you're not just, at a certain point you extend this far enough and it, it, it may work, but it, that may be get to be very long if this is a very high permeable foundation. This is where maybe a vertical element or some sort of filter that comes down here and intercepts this permeable foundation, probably a better solution because you're putting that filter protection down here instead of trying to drive it out too far. This is what that would look like. So you still have some sort of blanket. Maybe this berm isn't as big, but you do a, a, a filter trench um, near the toe. Uh, I've, I've done a few of these actually in a vertical configuration. The core has got a couple in design right now. Um, you can do them with you know, depending on your groundwater conditions, you can do just a standard shored excavated condition, or there's been a few that have been done using a biopolymer slurry, which is a, a you excavate it and it's supported with a biopolymer slurry, place the sand, and then you can put in hyperchloride. It'll, it'll degrade the slurry and turn to in, innate inert substances and it activates the trench. It's used a lot in um, hazardous and toxic wakes rehab. But now, again, we've got our filter, our foundation protected here. Not working on the embankment here, just working on the foundation for this one. So there's, here's another one, shallow toe drain. Uh, maybe we're just, we've got issues at the toe. You can put a filter and gravel and a pipe. You, you want to put a little berm over that to, to confine it. But just a, a simple toe drain could maybe address a lot of your foundation seepage issues. Similar concept, just you have to go deeper. Again, a lot of these are, are just kind of different examples to think about where do you, where do you put it? Where's, where, understanding where your seepage is, maybe you have to go deeper because you're trying to intercept these some deeper layers and you've suitable material, that would just can also be burned material, but same thing, a filter, a drain, a pipe, 
And then this is a, a little more robust view of it where you're actually getting into addressing not only foundation, but also embankment seepage. So you're gonna do your, your tow drain, your pipe, and then run a chimney up the embankment and cover it with a berm. Uh, similar to the one we showed a few slides ago, but we're just doing a, a deeper tow drain. And depending on how much water is coming through this embankment, um, you actually may need to do a two-stage chimney also, not just a filter. You need a filter and a drain on the, on the embankment. You know, the, the filter has a fair amount of capacity because it's on such a steep slope. But there are case histories where um, even that got overwhelmed. There, there's a dam up in Wyoming, I think Greg talked about it yesterday, um, where they, had, they did a single stage filter, had to come back in and do a, a second stage because that, that filter got overwhelmed because there's such large seepage flows. That was in a, a glacial foundation and they had a lot of open work gravels and the foundation conditions were putting a lot of water into that embankment. So again, understanding the foundation. And it, this, so the chimney, you know, gives you the defensive measures of the embankment, you've addressed foundation. And this is just a, a, a detail for you guys to have. It's something that I've done on a few projects where it's actually a, a vertical trench. Typically these are, you know, more of this trapezoidal, you lay it back, you place the fill. Um, but this does work for, for shallower applications. It's, it's actually, it's a trench box and they have a, more guides in the inside and they can just pull it along and, and it goes pretty quick and it's a lot less sand. So things, things to think about. Here's more of that trapezoidal section. Um, this is, these are actually from the, uh, the photos I showed about five, six slides ago. So the blanket drain down here, chimney drain. This one only had a single, uh, single chimney, didn't have a dual because most of the seepage on this one was coming through the foundation. So we weren't, we weren't, the embankment was really low permeability. We weren't concerned this was a foundation issue. So we had our blanket in here. Most of these dimensions are based off of constructability. You know, if you do your seepage analysis, say, oh, I, I only need two inches of filter sand and four inches of gravel. Well, that's really hard to build with an excavator. And you're gonna, you're also gonna get contamination. You know, no matter how careful you are, you know, I always kind of assume you're going to lose a few inches of the top and the bottom of this sand just from contamination. There's going to be un undulations in your foundation or somebody drives over it too soon. They might rut into it a little bit. So a foot thickness is kind of your, your minimum you want for these filters and drain materials, sometimes thicker. Again, you can do a trapezoidal section or more of a, a vertical type feature. So here's, here's kind of a combination of three of them where we've got a chimney, a berm, shallow toe drain, and then you have you do a trench drain or a leaf well that goes down deeper to help feed this toe drain. And then again, cutting off, this, cutting off the seepage, not cutting off the seepage, collecting the seepage, filtering your exits. You know, here's another concept I've worked with where we, there was an existing toe drain in place, but it didn't go deep enough. They were still having issues with seepage and there was concerns of internal erosion below the toe drain. So we came in and did a, 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 a thin, a thinner, I think it was two or three foot uh, vertical chimney downstream of that toe drain brought the filter material back so it's all connected. Again, you've, internal erosion can't get by it. You, you've now filtered, filtered your exit. So a, a chimney overlay, filter, chimney filter overlay. So this dash line's our original embankment. We'll cut back in, maybe you cut back into the embankment a little bit, still do a tow drain to collect it, put your filter in, put the berm on top. And then for an existing embankment, this is something what you're gonna see for your detail and how it's gonna get constructed. So your embankment's on the left. You're gonna bring that filter sand, you're gonna place it, you're gonna place it before you place whatever this burn material is in the right. Cause you want that filter material above your burn material so that you're not getting soil rolling into your filter and contaminating it. So what you're seeing here, these little triangles is just to represent to the contractor that, okay, you're gonna place it a lift higher. So it's gonna be, we need, we need this width, three feet, five feet, whatever it is, but there's gonna be some waste as it spills out over onto the adjacent fill We'll bring our fill up and then we'll place our next lift, bring our fill up, place our next lift. So you're always, looks like a Christmas tree. You know, if it's a new dam, you actually have it, the, the triangles are on both sides and it does look like a Christmas tree. So these are details you have in drawings to show the contractor, okay, this, there's going to be some waste here. There's going to be some additional material beyond the neat line volume you're going to have to place to build this, to maintain the integrity of this filter because we don't want it to get dirty. You know, if we're talking going from three to 5% fines, that's very little amount of soil that rolls in there that, that can disseminate and make your filter not functioning. So an internal chimney filter, this is a much more invasive than the previous one where we're maybe going, we're taking out the downstream shell to put a filter in against the core and then replace the fill material, blanket drain, toe drain. 
this is something you would probably need to re lower the reservoir, maybe drain the reservoir, because you're this is a pretty invasive rehabilitation right here where you're you're really really getting into this embankment. Again, think about your risks, think about your consequences, you know, understand what the stability of this structure is without that downstream shell. So chimney filters, they are the standard of care because um, they, 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 they handle defects in the embankment. So your blanket and your tow drain handle your foundation, your chimney handles your embankment, and there will be defects. It's not an if, it, it, it's a when. It also lowers the phreatic surface. Once, it, once seepage hits that chimney, it's gonna drop down, so your downstream shell should be in a, in a drained condition. So you in, increase your stability downstream. And from, from a risk analysis standpoint, if you, if, when we're going through and looking at, at embankments, if there's a chimney in there, it lowers the risk by a thousand. So this is not trivial. These are really impactful features in embankments. And, and they're the standard care for design new dams. They've really, I would say probably in the 60s or 70s became, should have been the standard care. It wasn't quite, but it, it mostly was. The, ma the major agencies were for sure. So how does it help you with a defect? Well, if you don't have a chimney and you've got a defect in the core, or maybe you had a, a winter shutdown. Greg talked about a winter shutdown in Jadwin. Maybe you had a winter shutdown here and you had a layer here and it's, it's in the northern part of America where you get long, cold winters and you get four foot of frost penetration. And let's just say, well, we're gonna, next spring they'll, they'll clean off the top foot, but they didn't get down four feet to where the frost tip went. So you've got a zone here that's, that's got, got issues. So if you don't have a, a chimney in here, well, you've got seepage coming through here. The core, if it's, could it break out into the downstream shell and you've got an internal erosion issue. Your, your chimney, your blanket drain doesn't help that much. Whereas if you've got the chimney, again, it stops that internal erosion and then drops the phreatic surface. So it's just, it's just, it's great insurance. And from a, a seepage standpoint, phreatic surface standpoint, these are just different representations of how chimneys impact the phreatic surface. So if you just have a, a pipe back here, well, your, 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 your flow lines are coming in back here. It's helping that you start pushing out that tow drain and you can see you get seepage on the face you put in the chimney and it addresses it. And if you keep increasing your conductivity, that chimney can still handle it as long as it's a properly designed chimney. You get down to these higher conductivities, that's where you might start looking at you need a two-stage chimney. So an event tree, how does this help? I mean, we've, we've talked about how it helps, but from a, from a risk standpoint, when you're thinking about it, so these are what we do in risk analysis. We build event trees to understand the, the, how, the, how the failure is gonna happen. So in this one, we have the reservoir rises, we start erosion, we've got some defect in there, and erosion continues because we don't have a filter. So this is where, if, if you have that chimney here, you've just stopped. Whereas if you don't have the filter, you start moving into, okay, it's gonna erode some more. We've got a clay material, so it's gonna form a pipe. So the pipe gets bigger, the pipe gets longer. We, we don't have material upstream that can, that can collapse into it and choke it off. We have no constriction upstream. Now, by now, we got a lot of water coming out, we can't intervene, and we get a breach. That's what I'm saying. This is where, how early in the process this chimney comes into play to help you. So I've got another Socrative question, if we could fire that one up. So this one is, to what upper elevation should a chimney extend? And there's, you answer whichever, one or multiple if you'd like. So top of Deadpool, top of Dam, Top of the core, the low permeability really fill, top of flood pool, or top of normal pool? There's multiple answers, and there's multiple correct answers. So historic practice was the top of the, the estimated phreatic surface. That, that's, that was a practice up until, I would say, 15, 10, 15, 20 years ago. The current practice is to the top of normal pool as a minimum. You want to at least get that normal pool. And ideally, if you can get it up to your maximum flood pool or as high as constructible. So we've got a few um, quotes by folks from a while ago. So just say this is not new concepts. So from Ripley, you know, he, he didn't find a, a single case of internal erosion if there was a downstream filter. 
and he called it zone of clean cohesion sand rich material. There's a downstream fil filter. He didn't find a single case where there's internal erosion, which kind of helps support that. Yep, you've got this in here. It, it works really well. Uh, Sherard. Sherard did a lot of research in the 70s and early 80s on hydraulic fracturing of dams, on filter design. Um, he and Talbot kind of did the, you know, really some of the seminal work in what is modern filter design practice in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. And, and you know, he, he's saying that there, there's sufficient evidence from dam behavior that the designer shall assume small concentrated leak can develop through impervious sections even without exceptional differential settlement. And, and he's got a paper, I think it's, it's in the ASCE Geotech Journal from 1986, I think it's 86, where he gets into here's how you can get concentrated leak erosion or hydraulic fracturing. And it's a, it's a good paper to read because it really kind of ties together a lot of this. What do you look for concerns? What do you look for for risks? Where are your weak points? Um, reclamation, you know, they, they say to, here's the construction defect side. To, to avoid construction defects, poor bonds, loose lifts, inadvertent pervious layers, desiccation, winter shutdowns is not in here, but that's one of them, dispersive soils, an inclined filter drain with a horizontal drainage blanket, which is what we've been showing in all these sections here, the chimney and the blanket, it's become almost standard. I would say, it, yeah, almost to it should it should maybe should be standard, because um, it, it it that a homogeneous section should rarely be used because you can, for what Sherard just said, you can get defects in that embankment, and if you don't have a filter, it's not going to stop. And then the Corps of Engineers, this is based on some stuff from Sherard in '84. Primary defense is a downstream filter, since we can't. Prevention of cracks cannot be insured, so we need to put a filter in. So I think I've beat that horse to its ultimate death. Put in a filter, please. So one stage versus two stage chimneys. So I touched on this a little bit. You know, the, the two stage can give you more capacity and then also gives you a little, little protection against if that filter gets uh, contaminated. So here's a similar figure we showed before, but now we have the filter at the chimney in. So if we have, if the capacity of the filter is less than the, your seepage coming through here, it can actually break out in the shell and now you've lost your filtering component. You could, you know, I think you could, there could be an argument to be made that, you know, this chimney would, shouldn't form a pipe and should still be a crack stopper and there's, it's still gonna have some benefit, but there's, there's, there's elevated risk that's not here with a functioning chimney. If you have the second, second, second stage, then the seepage just comes out into the shell into, sorry, into the drain and exits at the toe. So it's, a, it's still maintaining your, your filter without getting seepage into your downstream shell. So if you have a contaminated layer down here, same problem, the water can actually can't get out and it breaks out into the shell. If you have your two stage, instead of breaking into the shell, it goes into your, your, your drainage material and you haven't compromised your, your downstream shell and your internal erosion protection. These are, Again, all these, you probably would have a, another filter layer on top of this gravel layer to protect it from migration from above. Okay, relief wells. Uh, I mentioned these earlier that, you know, if you've got this low permeability foundation layer and a high underlying high permeability foundation that can get water somewhere up in the reservoir, you're gonna get this, this elevated foundation for attic surface, you're gonna get uplift. So where relief wells can come in, you can, puncture that, that, that lower permeability zone, and then it brings your phreatic surface down to wherever your discharge elevation is. The relief wells, they're, they're to relieve pore pressure and lower that phreatic surface within that confined strata in your foundation. They do re reduce uplift and improve stability. And then they also help control exit gradients. And, re and they reduce the potential for tenon erosion because they're lowering that uplift, they're lowering the seepage forces. Um, but they're not, a continuous filter. We got to keep that in mind. They, they lower seepage forces, but they're not a continuous filter. And they do require maintenance. Um, depending where you are in the, in, in the country, in the world, you know, biofouling, you know, and, and precipitates are ongoing issues. So they do require maintenance. You got to be cleaned. If you're not maintaining them, they become ineffective. Um, usually it takes years to decades that happen, but some, some conditions, if you've got a lot of water coming in and you got high iron contents, it can, it can, it can, happen pretty quickly. And this is where I said, you know, it's not a, a filter, it's not a continuous filter. So if you just need to reduce pore pressures, it's a good solution. 
But if you also have a, a foundation internal erosion issue, backwards erosion piping, something like that, a trench drain might be a better option because it gives you that continuous filter. So again, getting back to understanding those foundation conditions and site characterization. So a lot of these slides were gone over yesterday, two days ago, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go through these pr pretty quick then. So the filters and drains, Greg and I should have coordinated a little better on our presentations, but it's important, that's why we're showing it again. So natural versus processed materials. Usually, you're gonna get a processed material, you're gonna get something that's manufactured. In the hundred some dams I've worked on, I've had one dam where we had an on-site sand and gravel that was filter compatible with our core. And, and, and we did, I don't know, 40 gradations and they all fell right in the filter band line. It was awesome because it saved a whole bunch of money, but that's one out of a hundred. And I haven't seen one, and that was 10 years ago, so I, it's, it's been a while. There's usually problems with natural soils. C33 is a great, a great filter product. I'm not gonna touch much on this. I think we've already covered that. The one thing I, I maybe wanna hit on is there are, there are some um, clays that have a really high fines content, clay fraction, that C33 does not work with, and you have to add a transition material. That can be a challenge because there's, usually that transition material is really fine sand and it doesn't have the permeability requirement that you want. So you've gotta make sure you're putting enough confining stress you know, a berm over it so that you are forcing the water through the transition into the filter, into your drainage materials. I think you guys did a, a filter design yesterday. So again, you're just, in your rehab, you're just trying to fit between your design. Here's where C33 fits, kind of catches the edge. Again, 3% fines in stockpile, 5% in place. You're gonna get some breakdown. Uh, my experience, it's it's usually less than a percent. It's, it's If you have good, good quartz sand, it's usually less than a percent. But if you go less than five, you know, if you do increase your fines content by 5%, you are looking at an order of magnitude change decrease in hydraulic conductivity. So it doesn't take much fines to mess up a filter. And then standard gradations. When you're doing designs, I always start with your state regs. They're gonna have some sort of filter and gravel gradations. Try to fit those. If those don't, because if, you can find a local product, you can have a lot of suppliers that can provide it. And there's very few suppliers that are gonna to wanna to change their screen setup to make sand for you, you know, at a commercial, a commercial aggregate. If you do it on site, that's another story. If you're buying from a commercial source, it's just hard. So you try to find a commercial product that fits with you. And, and sometimes you're, you start look, talking to local suppliers and see what, see what they have. Did you cover this, Greg, or not, the gravel envelopes? Yes, okay, all right. So again, we want, to, we want two stage filters. There's been a lot of pipes put in with just a sand in the olden days. <laughs> and the sand would plug the slots and it would just reduce the capacity of that pipe and it, it wouldn't function as designed. Um, Reclamation Core and RCS all have design criteria as to what that gradation should be. Um, like the Core of Engineers is less than D50, the max opening size is your, is your, your gradation is less than, greater than D50, your max opening size. So you're just not getting materials to roll in and plug it. This is a, just an example of a, is this Washakie, Greg? I think it's Washakie, yeah. Where they just had the, the single stage sand and you can see it's just, it's, it's encrusted. You should, this should be, you know, you're seeing brown in these slots, that's sand. It should be black, it should be a shadow. So they, it's pretty much plugged off and they just start spitting water in there. It doesn't, they don't work as designed. So a couple dams that have been rehabbed successfully with, with tow drains. Greg worked on Washakie up in Wyoming where they had an order of magnitude of 10 increase in flow increased. And that's just because the, the drain collected it. They were having seepage issues. Now they're actually collecting that monitoring and filtering it. So that seepage was there. They just now have it. And Taro Dam is one I worked on in Colorado. We went up by a factor of four. Again, we, this was one where we had a, that I showed the detail of the tow drain and then we came back and did a, a trench down below it. That was that dam. And we just picked up a lot more of that seepage and gave it a filtered exit. Uh, just another zoom in detail. We've got a few of these earlier slides of the, this is more of the trapezoidal. Key takeaway here is you want a minimum of a foot of gravel around the pipe. Again, that's all that, con that constructability side of it. And then as far as pipe materials, this is a Bureau of Reclamation paper from 2009, which is a, which is a good paper. 
uh, talks about, they, they did a bunch of study, a lot of it looking at the hollow pipes behaved in crushing. And the, I think the big takeaway here is um, HDPE, solid HDPE is good, but you gotta field, field fabricate it. Um, dual at HDPE and C900 PVC, you can field, field, field slot and it's just a, a better product that both behave well. Uh, perforations versus slots. Um, slots and perforations can both be factory installed. Slots are only factory installed. Perforations can be done in the field. Oops, there's been studies uh, on the reduction of inlet capacity with perforations due to plugging. And basically, the, you can, the, the particles can roll into a perforation because there's a larger open area versus a, a thin slot. And the, the, there's just more options with slotting out there. I'm perf I personally prefer slots if you can do them. Perforations do work. I, I think slots are give you a little more uh, resiliency in your design. Geotextiles. So, they're, they, the geotextiles can be, have, are, are sold and marketed as, as a filter. Um, and they can provide filtering components to them. They, they have their weaknesses. They're definitely susceptible to insulation damage. If you do it carefully, you can probably get away from it, but you know, this, this, is, this is fabric that's very thin. Um, it's a single line of defense that's, that's this thick versus a filter that's gonna be you know, three, four, five feet thick. So think about the resiliency part of it, the redundancy part of it. If it tears, your filtering cap capacity is gone. And there's been a lot of studies where they do clog. You, you get, my, I mean, they're doing what they're supposed to. They're filtering, but they clog. Now you've raised your phratic surface because you're not letting the seepage through. And Corps of Engineers Reclamation, they prohibit um, geotextiles in critical locations. And critical locations are defined as filters and drains for embankments. So they're not, the Corps of Reclamation does not use them. Um, there's some camps out there that, that use them for some some circumstances. I'd really recommend if you can, you try to you find a sand filter. It's just more resilient, more robust. There's just less things that can go wrong with it from just the size of it alone. You know, you're not relying on something that's a fraction of an inch to be your whole filter protection. All right, seepage seepage cutoff methods. The cutoffs in quotes because that, that's that's an old term. We we call them barrier walls now or because or, you really can't cut it all off. You can reduce it. You're never going to cut it all off. Everything has an innate permeability. permeability. So we're going to touch a little bit on these here before lunch. Um, grouting, I talked a little bit about this morning. I'll give you a few more points on that. Talk about low permeability bank, blankets. And then after lunch, we will get into barrier walls. So grouting, as I said, we're trying to reduce the conductivity of a, of a foundation layer. Um, and you want to you want to get this down into a low permeability zone. You don't want this to be a hanging grout curtain, or it's just going to go underneath you, and you haven't solved your problem. And the hanging curtains do have issues because seepage can go underneath you. So they can be used as a standalone seepage barrier, and they have been on many many dams. Um, it's first recorded grouting was 1893 in the U.S. So this is this is not new technology. There's a lot of qualified contractors. But they can also be used as part of a, of a barrier wall system. It's as a pretreatment, and we'll, we'll talk some more about that this afternoon on, on how, that, how that applies and, and how it's needed in some scenarios. And again, I know I've been beating this, but you gotta understand your, your site characterization. You gotta understand your site to do, your, do a correct design. Um, there, you, know, there, you can do some grouting in soils, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty limited. Um, Hydrofracturing is a risk in soils and in soft bedrocks too. So you, you need to be careful that you don't, again, you don't make things worse. You hydrofracture it, you've now just induced a new flaw into your foundation. You can hydrofracture hard rock, but it requires a lot more pressures. You know, the, the Hoover Dam thing this morning, they were, you know, pressurizing to, to reservoir pool. That's a very hard rock. Again, the route only goes into air and water filled voids. It, does, it doesn't go into the matrix. And it could deteriorate over time. We talked about that, you know, especially with older grouts, they, they bled out. Um, I think there's, there's less risk with that with modern balanced grouts. And I suppose the jury's out for another 20 years how, how much that risk may be or not. And, and then there's risk drilling through embankments. So you want to make sure you have a case boring so you don't, you don't have fluid contact with your soil, with your earthen embankment or your soil foundation, because you could hydraulically fracture it pretty easily. And there's been a lot of cases where that has happened during investigations a dam was hydrofractured. 
and depending on, on your, your ground and your pressure, you could actually wash out soil filled joints, depending on how much pressure you're putting on it and, and, and what that soil filling is. So from a historical perspective, so Terzaghi, you know, we're talking 70 years ago, said they should not assume to be 100% effective. And Casa Grande, probably 60 years ago, was saying, you know, triple row grout curtain should be your standard of care. And again, there's been a lot of advances in the last 30 years on, on, on the mix side of it. So that, that triple row, you have a, yeah, usually what you do is you do your downstream row first, and you're trying to re initially reduce your, your, your conductivity, your permeability of your bedrock. Then you do your upstream row, reduce it further, and then the middle row is kind of your confirmation to say, okay, did we get it all? And then you have them angled at different directions because you know there's joint fractures, they're orientated at different ways. You know, generally you're going to have some standard, you know, joint set at a, at, a, at, a, at a site, but it could be all over the place too. If you have a lot of stress relief, they could be randomly orientated. So that's why you, you know, these I think are showing at 15 degrees. You design that for your site condition, but they're usually, usually your upstream and downstream are angled opposite each other to intersect opposite features. And your center row is usually a vertical or some shallower angle just to, to, to close things up. You can do a lot of data collection while drilling. You're understanding, and this is real time. So you're understanding what you're doing, how much grout's going in the ground, what your pressures are, what your takes are, and, and you can modify as you go. And if you have, and then you know, you know, real time if you have problems, if you have areas with, with large grout takes. Blankets. So um, these are something where maybe we have, we have a seepage issue and an embankment through a foundation. So we're going to come in and put a, a, a some sort of blanket on the top. That can be a low permeability clay material, or it can be a, a, a geomembrane. Both have their benefits, both have their risks. So soil blankets, depending on your part of your country, are really susceptible to, free, to freeze thaw issues. Um, and your, incre your permeability increases over time. I worked on a project where they, put, they did a line to reservoir, did a, I think a three foot compacted clay embankment. Within two years, from a seepage standpoint, it's like the blanket wasn't there. Because this was in Wyoming, we had a lot of freeze thaw, and it, it had just essentially opened up that blanket so it wasn't the reservoir didn't even see it at that point in time. Geomembranes, very low permeability. There is some risk of puncture, but you can reduce that by, by burying them. And, and from geosynthetic liars, there's, there's a lot of products out there. There's a lot of really qualified installers. You know, this is used a lot in landfills and um, waste sites and mining industry. So there's, there's, there's a lot of products with a lot of proven record out there. Um, depending on what your conditions are. So the HDPE is really strong. The, the LLDPE can handle a lot of deformation if you're expecting a lot of settlement. You know, understand what products you need. Geosynthetic clay liner is essentially two geotextiles with bentonite in between it. So it, it, when it gets wet, it hydrates and seals up. And there's others besides what's on this list. Again, very low permeability, a lot of installers. And if it's, if it's done right, there's a really good case history. And as I think the oldest liner is probably in the 60 years old and, and still performing well. So it's, it's a plastic product, there's gonna be some deterioration, but if it's protected and buried, it, it should last for an extended period of time. Kind of like the filter, you're now relying on a single thin barrier to protect yourself. Now, if you do it right, you should be good, but maybe you think about, okay, if you, if you bury it, that helps a lot because you, you protect it from surface disturbance. Um, a project in Wyoming worked on, actually the concern was antelope would walk across it and puncture it. So a risk you wouldn't think about in design is, is animal damage, but it does happen. You got to worry about the stresses on the liner. Um, you know, are you going to get deformation? Is it going to move? But usually your worst case on, on liners is in, during your installation period. And that, that's when you have the most stress usually put on it. And there's usually limitations on how steep of a slope you can place a liner on. Rule of thumb is three to one. You can do it steeper. We have done it steeper. Um, but it's because you're putting a lot of stress on that liner when you're putting a cover material and putting a liner down. So that's usually your worst case. When you go through all the calcs, it's usually an installation. And then for dams, something to think about is, okay, maybe I do something redundant. You know, you can do stuff where you have a, maybe put an HDPE over a geosynthetic clay liner. So if you get punctures in the plastic product, the bentonite is behind you to seal up any punctures and it's kind of that belt and suspenders. And if possible, put a drainage layer under there. You, you, you can take, get the water out so it doesn't keep going through your embankment. You can 
you're filtering before the embankment, I guess, but you're, you're taking, taking care of uh, whatever seepage may come through. So this is a, a, a kind of a common detail. You can find something similar to this in a lot of textbooks for embankment. So up here at the top, you've got a, uh, an anchor trench, and this is basically just for installation. It's not holding this thing into place once it's there. It's just for installation. Wrap it down the slope. Uh, this one, they, had a, they did have a drain, blow it, a filter sand, filter material drain, and then just two foot of fill and riprap and bedding. Nothing overly complex. Here's some photos from installation. So we're standing on the reservoir bottom, looking up at the dam. Here's that drainage layer with, that actually, there was a vertical chimney, or sorry, vertical trench drain that went on the upstream toe to collect that seepage and it would, it would carry out through a penetration embankment. So put in the filter material. This was a two stage. Geosetting clay liner and HDPE. A little more close up of the GCL and HDPE. So GCL, that, those are just overlapped. And then there's a bentonite, more bentonite you put in the overlap to give you your seam. The HDPEs and all the other ones, those are actually welded together. And there, there's, a, there's a lot of steps you go through to make sure your welds are sound, that you don't have leaks at the welds because you know, the product itself is gonna be really good. So where you get leaks, you're gonna leak it just like everything else. Leaks at your contacts, leaks at your changes. That's what you gotta look for. And then here we're, this is how I was standing on the crest of the dam, looking down, here's the, the liner, starting to bring cover material up. And this is, and they're, they're bringing more fill in. And the, basically this dozer is pushing the fill up the slope. Because if you push down the slope, you put a lot more stress on that liner at that top and you have more risk of tearing this thing out of the top. That's why you're, you're pushing from the bottom up. And again, this is, think about it, this is your worst case. You're putting not only a static load, but you got that dynamic load of that dozer going up and down and you're restricting how big this piece of equipment is. It's a low pressure dozer. There's lots of nuances on this installation to make sure you don't damage what you just put in. Thanks everybody. <laughs>